All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to uh, welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day of May in the year of the Lord, 2022. And this is part two, or B, of uh, this, the video. So I wanted to break it up. I didn't want to go for an hour and a half, or however long this goes for. Uh, so what I want, really wanted to talk about, again, was the, the previous video I'd done, I don't know, a week or so ago now, on the, on the uh, sort of the the idea of uh, institutional state or Christianity, societal Christianity, Christianity as a basis for society, Constantinian Christianity versus New Testament Christianity, real Christianity. And this sort of came up in regard to. Uh, Russia and Ukraine and Putin's uh, restoring Christianity as a uh, spiritual foundation for Russia, Re restoring Russia to its uh, historic Orthodox, Russian Orthodox faith. Not as a uh, mandatory state religion, but rather as a state favored religion, <laughs> definitely favored, uh, but not under the authority of uh, the uh, the king of Russia, or the prince of Russia, whatever you want to call it, the president of Russia, uh, Putin. Um, because I think Putin and the Russians, because of the experience under the communists, the atheism, came to realize that there is no spiritual foundation there. You can't build on sand. And uh, Russia failed. Uh, Soviet Union failed in 70 years. Basically one full generation. Or as people that saw the revolution were still alive when it all caved in. And America is has no foundation either. It's built on sand. And that's why we see society, in not just in America, but in the West... Uh, has has no no unity. Nothing binds it together other than civil religion, the Constitution, which is nothing but an empty symbol now. Just read it and then look at what the government's doing and you'll really get depressed <laughs> because the Constitution of the United States is an abject failure because the purpose, the fundamental purpose of the Constitution was not just to... to uh, to change the form of the central government, the federal government, from the, uh, what did they call it before that? The, the, the Confederate, uh, Articles of Confederation, to the, uh, uh, the association of the states to a more uh, solid center. But the purpose of the Constitution was to, to limit the power and authority of the federal government. That was its fundamental thing to say you could you 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 exist. Your powers are A B C D. That's it. You can't go beyond that. Well, people are sinners. They didn't stop there. Look at today this this uh, behemoth. That's the federal government today. And look at the Constitution, and you realize almost everything they do is unconstitutional and hence unlawful. When they talk about a living Constitution, they mean reducing the Constitution to a mere symbol and making it say whatever you want, taking it out of the way, because the Constitution is supposed to be an obstacle to government power. 
to, to, to get back to constitutional government would require a revolution just like the original did. You'd have to overthrow it all. It'd be more of a revolution. Because the government is far more entangled in everyday life than the King of England ever, ever was. This is Satan's work. He wants to bind you to the world, which he controls. The social media is part of it. He wants to separate you from God. He wants to bind you to what he controls. He's been very successful at it. Except for this one thing called the cross and the resurrection, which spelled the end of his kingdom. And we're waiting for the king to return to take back what belongs to him. And we will return with him, his people. So uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit was with, with uh, Putin and the restoration of the favored status of orthodoxy. You know, on, on the one hand, I am glad for that because atheism is nothing Constantinian Christianity, where you had the, the church, state, union, marriage thing that goes back to Nicaea uh, and developed quickly from there to a full Christianity. The state-approved form of Christianity is the only legitimate religion, which happened within a generation or so, of Constantine. Uh, or a couple generations. Uh, by Theodosius, it definitely was there. Now, <clears throat> uh, paganism was unlawful, persecuted. Any, any, any deviation from state Christianity was persecuted. Even at Nicaea, those that did not uh, agree with the Nicaean Creed. See, the Creed is... is uh, is Latin or just for I believe. In other words, you have to say I believe what the creed says. And I don't believe at all. It's like there's things in the in the uh, Nicene Creed that talks about the uh, Christ being begotten, eternal be the eternal begetting of Christ. And it's like, where does the Bible teach that? It talks about the begottenness of the Son. It's talking about his incarnation. To say that the eternal God eternally beget the Son is like, really? That has to do with Aristotle and philosophy and not the, the Bible at all. That's, that's people reinterpreting the Bible. We shouldn't do that. The, the the God, the Lagos, became flesh and dwelt among us. That's leave it where God leaves it. That would be wisdom. Anything beyond that speculation has no authority over you. So uh anyway, uh Nicaea, yeah, there's some things in there that are like, okay, prove it from the scriptures. But if you've got the scriptures, why do you need Nicaea? don't you don't but it was the beginning of the the subjugation of christianity to the state constantine the emperor called for the synod to come and settle a religious thing because he wanted christianity to to be the unity of the empire because it had no unity other than the Roman legions and power, power of the sword. So uh, that was his purpose, obviously. He was not a Christian. Let's be clear about this. Whether or not, it's sort of like Trump. The, the Christianity of Trump uh, is his, what he regarded as his church was the church of Norman Vincent Peale which was the antecedent of Robert Schuller, which was a blending of mind science uh, with some elements of Christianity. And that, that explains why he chose Paula White
to be his spiritual advisor, too, by the way. I just realized that this morning. Aha! That's why. The prosperity gospel. See, that prosperity gospel and Norman Vincent Peale, he's probably the original, you know, the uh, uh, you get what you think kind of thing and positive confession, it all, and it goes back to Christian science, and which isn't science and it's not Christian. It is uh, more like witchcraft. In a lot of ways, it is witchcraft. Uh, <clears throat> but you put Christian labels on it and people don't know the difference because <laughs> they don't know what real Christianity is. Because of Constantine. So you had this, the the Constantine, it's not a perversion, it's really a, a subordination. Uh, he, it is a subverting, subverting Christianity to a secular purpose, uh, a, a social foundation. Now, certainly Christianity provides some revelation of God and God as a, uh, you could have Christianity as a social basis, but you can't make it part of the state because it's not part of the state by its very nature. It's a kingdom of God. And true Christianity, because as Jesus said, narrow is the way and small is the gate that leads to life, and few there are that find it, See, state Christianity has to be a Christianity for everyone, just like uh, the king of England. He was the head of the church. He declared himself the head of the church. Well, so what? Pope declared himself the head of the church, too. So it's like man-made religion. And if you didn't agree with the king being the head of the church, well, you might lose your head. And that's where you Constantinian gets it, Constantinian leads to uh, Constantine leads to that his Constantinianism. This this marriage between a well even then it was a weakened form of Christianity. It had already begun to get into clericalism. Uh, the clergy and the laity divide was already present. Sacramentalism, where the the uh, what happens, see, natural man, natural humanity, unregenerate humanity, people that aren't born again, because they cannot see the kingdom of God, they cannot perceive spiritual realities, cannot understand it, is foolishness to them. So they take the visible signs, water baptism and uh, the, the, the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper or communion, the Eucharist, whatever word you want to use there for it, name you want to use, and they take that as the actual substance rather than the, the simply the sign of the substance, which is spiritual and unseeable, and confuse the physical with the spiritual. And if you don't accept their confusion, like the bread has become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, say, no, that's just a sign of the reality that Christ is in us, and he died for us. He said, do this in remembrance of me. If you don't accept the biblical or the, the state interpretation, you can lose your head or be burned at the stake. What happened? And today, you know, like we live in a cancel culture, if you don't accept the the reality of 150 genders, you might get persecuted, especially in certain positions. If you say there's only two genders, maybe three. <laughs> Greek has three in the language. Neuter. Neuter, neutered is one of them. So you got masculine, feminine, and neutered. Okay, that works physically. That's it. If you don't accept the reality that you can be whatever imaginary thing you, you can imagine, which I don't know how you can imagine any of that because there's nothing in physical creation that works that way. <sighs> Sexuality, it's always gendered. 
Anything else is a perversion of purpose. Is it not? Except, see, but we live in an existential world that you create your own reality. Well, but sorry, you still have to live in God's reality. Otherwise, you know, you can fly like a bird. Try it. See how long you last. Can't. Of course, go to university, spend maybe $100,000, and lose your mind. You can go to the local, uh, go down, down the street, find a drug dealer, and lose your mind there. It's cheaper. A lot easier, too. Maybe a lot less damaging than losing your mind to what they call edu higher education these days, or even lower education. They kind of get it down into the pre pre K. Pre K. Evil. Decadent, reprobate society. That's what happens. But that isn't the result of Constantinianism. That's a result of rejecting Constantinianism for atheism, which happened in 1776, by my estimation. A revolution. By the way, when you look at Babylon the Great in the Book of Revelation, it does, has a, it does have a remarkable resemblance to the United States. Uh, anyway, the... Uh, Constantinianism is a has a form of Christianity, an outward form. It has the vis it, it can point people to God. It has elements of Christianity. It has Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead. The central act of worship in all Christianity is the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Even if some churches have gotten so far away from the Bible, they don't recognize that. But it, it, it is a central, it's not the sermon, <clears throat> but the, the central act of worship, of remembrance, of coming together, is uh, not only to, to care for one another and edify one another, but to partake together in the Lord's Supper. Communion. Communion in Christ is our communion. And of course, to, to take that physic to to see that as a physical thing, but uh, is simply not understanding the Bible in a mature way. Uh, it doesn't mean it's less real. Spiritual is more real than physical. But some man-made idea that didn't have come about until a thousand years later of transubstantiation. Is, and then killing people because they don't believe on your, your crazy idea. Well, <clears throat> we just read a section earlier in, in, second, uh, in uh, Colossians chapter 2 where it talks about those that would take you captive through nonsense of their own visions of their own imagination. The Catholic Church is full of nonsense like that. 2,000 years almost of nonsense. Now, even from the second century, you see this gradual uh, decline in Christianity with uh, a development of the clergy and laity distinction and sacramentalism. The people believed, began to believe that water baptism saved you. Now, you have to remember, too, that this was under a hostile environment. So to be baptized was, a commi was committing yourself in a semi-public manner to Christ. It was officially joining the Christians. And if that could cost you your life, it was if you didn't have faith in Christ, you didn't do it. So it was an act of faith. It was a confession of Christ. Nobody got baptized at the early periods, because they'd lose everything. They'd, in in uh, in Israel, in the first century, early on, uh, in the beginning of the book of Acts, people 
you know, when, when a person confessed Christ, they were put out of the synagogues. They were put out of their social network. They were likely to be disowned by their family, which is why Paul was taking up collections for the saints at Jerusalem. That's why you had uh, the uh, the first chapters of Acts where you have the, the Christians giving uh, land and other things to... Uh, uh, to the church to distribute to those in need because they would have been disowned by their families, lost everything, and basically homeless. And they were Christians, so their brothers and sisters were required by God to love the brethren as themselves. That's the, cir the circumstance. You did not become a Christian for frivolous reasons because it would make your business better or because it would help you lose weight or who knows what. Because you were going there for social reasons. You didn't do that. So some of these things that we be, we tend to read into history, what we currently understand is not right. And you can look at some of the descriptions of the Lord's Supper and that. You can see where they they used language that was spiritual, but we can look at it and see, you know, that's going to lead into difficulties down the road. Well, they didn't know that at the time. They did not know that at the time. Of course, they weren't writing Scripture either. But then the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church makes tradition equal to Scripture. It has to. It comes from Nicaea comes from Constantine, and it develops. I mean, that that's just a major uh, mile marker at a big transition. You had this gradual decline, and then you have Nicaea, and it's this huge thing where the church and the world wed each other. Or not wed. Commit adultery. The church moves in with the world. But it still retains the central elements of, of the facts of Christ and still retains the scriptures. And you often will find more scripture read in a Roman Catholic church. I don't know what they do in a typical Orthodox service, but I imagine as part of the liturgy. See, most churches didn't even have a Bible. They may have had a... Uh, uh, the liturgical book where you had your scripture readings uh there was there's more of those around i think than biblical manuscripts but uh, uh the lect lectionary a lectionary uh so that those are good elements you have the so there's a lot of good in constantinian christianity however it makes claims this, this is the real issue and this is what I want to talk about. I don't believe that biblical New Testament Christianity, which is spiritual, which is a relationship with God through Christ, a personal relationship, is compatible with Constantinian Christianity, state Christianity, societal Christianity. Because societal Christianity is for all of society. Okay, you become a Christian by being baptized as an infant. You're just so most people, even in the United States, uh, we've got even even today. There's like 65 percent, at least 65 percent of Americans still call themselves a Christian. Are they? No, no way. Maybe five percent. Five percent, because if Christ is not the center of your life, if he is not, you know, if it was a choice between Christ and something else, you'd choose the other thing. Well, you're not a Christian. So unlike, you know, you, you had to be willing to, to literally put your life on the line in the early days to become a Christian. Because you knew it was not something the world's going to approve of. And we're getting back to that point in the United States. So the numbers of professing Christians are going down. They're, they're, they're counting the cost and saying it's not worth it. I'm not really serious about that. I'm not serious about I don't belong to Christ. I belong to myself. I'll do what I please. That person's not a Christian. 
So, again, Constantinian Christianity, which the United States rejected in 1776, uh, has a still has a, a abiding testimony of Christ. Roman Catholicism, the central aspect, and I, I've never actually in person watched an Orthodox service. I wish I could. I'd have to go quite a ways. But uh, to have a better understanding of what goes on in a typical thing. Maybe I'll do that someday. Maybe I'll actually interview a, an Orthodox priest someday. Who knows? But uh, the in Roman Catholicism, which I know quite well, having married into a Roman Catholic family and been present at many masses and being married at Catholic Church and studying it from the time, especially from the time I I was considering marrying my, my wife, I wanted to make sure I understood Roman Catholic Catholicism. She wasn't a a devout Catholic, nor her sister or brother, but uh, her parents were. So I have personal experience, and I live down the Mexican border where everybody's Roman Catholic, essentially, unless you're fundamentalist or, or uh, Pentecostal. <laughs> so they're pretty much the other options. So, but the... So you, you again. There, that's you often have more scripture reading in a say a Roman Catholic church, with your your Old Testament reading, and I think there's at least two lead, readings in the lectionary. There's always an Old Testament reading and a New Testament or gospel reading. Uh, sometimes I think there's three. I'm not quite sure. I haven't haven't attended one for a while. While well, I was thinking about the lectionary, but uh, I guess I could buy a missal, couldn't I? which is your own copy of the thing. Uh, and you always have the Mass, uh, except for COVID. Most Catholic church ha churches, unless they're really small and they had a traveling priest, had a daily Mass, a daily celebration of the Eucharist or communion or Lord's Supper, whatever you, word you want to use, the bread and the wine, the consecration of the bread and the wine and well, Catholics only get to have the bread, unless you're the priest. Except at my wedding, we got the both. Wow, that's just surprising. Um, but there's, uh, I didn't convert to Catholicism, by the way, obviously. But there are, there is a testimony of Christ there. And I don't want to, re, re, uh, but it's 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 been encrusted with tradition and empowered by the state. In the West, empowered by the Pope, which became the de facto ruler of the West, the papacy. Historically, I mean, there's no denying that. And then in Protestantism, there was simply a replacement with the, of the Pope going back more toward Constantinianism with the state. Lutheranism, the state. Uh, Calvinism, the state-church partnership. Yeah, the state and church in bed together. Uh, Anglicanism, the king as the head of the church and the head of the state. See, Protestantism is simply getting rid of the Pope and going back to Constantine or Theodosius, whatever you want to say there, but I'm using Constantinian as a defined marker. Uh, the, the problem is, as I said, it's, it's not so much uh, other than the false doctrines, things that are not totally unscriptural, like you know the prayers to Mary and things like that, which go back quite a ways, by the way the growth of those things. With Constantine, because it all of a sudden Christianity became not persecuted and favored by the government, you had all kinds of pagans becoming Christians without actually becoming Christians. See, this is where you get, really brings the power to sacramentalism. Because 
state relig religion requires sacraments to ha be a a effective. Well, actually, claims are effective. And this is where the real issue comes in. Because of the claims by the the uh, the Constantinian churches, I can't think of a better word to describe it. This church-state union, where the uh, the societal Christianity, in order to be to serve the function of holding the 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 state together, the the people together. You have to have, it has to work for everyone. In other words, you can't restrict it to people that are born again, real Christians. So you have to be able to make people into Christians without really making them into real Christians, which is which is the claims of the, the uh, effectual working of water baptism. That by sprinkling a baby, you converted them to a Christian with water and a priest. See, there's, there's no basis for this in the New Testament. Not in any, unless you're trying to read it in, which is what they do. But for the, for the functioning of Constantinian Christianity, You have to have sacraments and a priesthood that can make pagans into Christians. Simply. Well, I want to become a Christian. Doesn't matter why you want to become a Christian. And it gradually became easier and easier. But especially with Constantine, it became very easy because lots of people wanted to get in for lots of reasons. There was no cost anymore. It was a social benefit to become a Christian. So you got baptismal regeneration, which doesn't save anyone. Didn't save me. I was sprinkled as a baby. All Christianity, I mean, Orthodox Christianity and Roman Catholicism, they regard my baptism as an infant as valid because it was done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They regard that as valid. I was not born again. The Spirit of God did not dwell in me. I occasionally had uh, near-death encounters with the, with the Spirit of God. I mean, I, I did. God does lots of things in the world. Convicts sinners of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I can remember as a young child being convicted of my sin. Because I was a sinner. Man, at one time I can really remember that. Just broke me down to tears. And my mother told me, don't worry about it. Oh, man. She just, well, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes you don't even know how to respond because you don't know what's going on in somebody else. So I don't want to be critical of her. Uh, she, uh, she, uh, she's still alive, and she uh, always was took her faith seriously. Went to women's Bible study and all that, read the Bible. And uh, uh, she was a Lutheran, but... Uh, when you act, when it came down to it, and you pressed her on things, are you saved by faith or are you saved by baptism? She said, "Well, by some faith, of course." See, Luther was confused on these things too. So, uh, <clears throat> she recognized the, the 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 tension between some of these things, and when pressed, she'd come down on the right side because that's what the Bible taught. But, but you know. <laughs> And when you see somebody, especially a young child, and they're they're all upset about something, you don't know what's going on in them. And I, I just all I knew was going on was, I was guilty of sin, and I'm going going to hell because the neighbor boy told me that. In fact, he didn't accuse me; he just mentioned a commandment: "Thou shalt not steal." Holy Spirit just put that thing as a sword right through my heart. Didn't save me though. I was convicted of my sin. It wasn't saved. Didn't know anything about salvation. Didn't know. <sighs> Neighbor was a Baptist, about a year or two older than me. He was just sharing a Sunday school lesson with me about the commandments. 
Well, the purpose of the commandment is to show you're a sinner, and it sure did. And uh, see, see these elements. You could almost look at at Constantinian Christian as a Christianity as a pre pre preparatory place, in some ways, but it's not authentic born again Christianity, and that's the problem, and that creates a tension. And I was thinking, is there a way to for the two to exist to coexist in peace? And I don't think so. It's not. The problem, from my point of view, as a born-again Christian, the problem is the false doctrines. That they are teaching people that because you were baptized as an infant, or, well, this goes for Protestantism, too. So it could be, you know, believers, so-called believers' baptism, but it's the water that does it, you know, these kind of things, Church of Christ stuff. Uh, and others, uh, Protestantism, Lutheranism, uh, Calvinism to a lesser degree, but Lutheranism, baptismal regeneration. Some forms of uh, uh, Calvinism, uh, like uh, the stuff from Moscow, Idaho, with uh, what's his name up there, the the objectivity of the covenant. Uh, oh, Douglas Wilson. Uh, reformed is not enough. So you have you have a movement among Calvinists to refer to to go back to sacramentalism, the objectivity of the, the baptism as the infant baptism as putting you in the covenant in some weird sort of way. Definitely a con weird conditional sort of way. Uh, but that is not true Christianity. And that's there, that's where the tension is. From my point of view is, okay, they're teaching things that don't, like infant baptism makes you a Christian. No, it doesn't. Christ in you makes you a Christian. That's where the Bible identifies it. That Christ must dwell in you. You must be born again, born of the Spirit, baptized into the Spirit, into Christ by the Spirit, so that Christ is in you and you are in Christ. That's spiritual. Water baptism is just a symbol of that or a sign of that. The, the, being baptized in water for a baby does not cause that to take place. Now, baptism for a believer as a confession and commitment to Christ, the two can occur simultaneously. Where you're publicly confessing Christ and identifying yourself with him and the church. So I'm, there is a connection, although you can be baptized into Christ by the Spirit independently of that. I was. And I was baptized by immersion later because I was convinced that it was the right thing to do, biblically speaking. You know, so there's... When were the apostles baptized? <laughs> Other than the Apostle Paul. Hmm. I don't know. It doesn't mention that in the Bible at all. Uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, so but Jesus baptized no one. So who baptized Peter and John and James? And... Don't know. It doesn't make that doesn't make you saved. It is that relationship to Christ. See, uh, a believer in water, adult water baptism, or believers' water baptism, not be adult. But the person really knows what they're doing. They're doing it for the right reason. Committing themselves uh, publicly before others, before Christians, uh, to Christ. In, uh, and and uh, baptism as a God-ordained means to do that. Not saying it's the only means. And the church has never had it, held it was the only means. Martyrdom was a way, too. But in other words, if you did them, did that you were again in a situation where uh, society is hostile to Christianity, it said more meaning, because there's not really any advantage to becoming a Christian otherwise, other than for the right motives. Typically, it still happens occasionally, but to please parents, to please a spouse, something like that can be a problem. <coughs> 
but still, the real thing, it, it can occur. Uh, but infant baptism does not affect salvation. It does not cause it. That's, there's no biblical basis for that. And the, some of the doctrines of the Eucharist, the, the transubstantiation or consubstantiation, which is a little more fluid. In fact, when I was considering looking at the uh, uh, church to attend after, you know, I got tired of COVID and everything, and pretty much came to the conclusion the nursing home was not going to, was not looking for anybody to come back in there. Uh, <clears throat> But looking at the actual doctrines of the, ch the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate, I came to. I was going to talk to the the pastor there, a pastor in quotes, because really functions more like a priest, sort of. Uh, clergy is a, you know that's a that's an unbiblical concept. Uh In fact, it might become a, an issue at uh, even a church I attend in some ways. Because I was wondering, why aren't they uh, doing communion when the, the pastor is just because he's, I don't know. I don't know what their view on that is. It, things have been chaotic here lately. We didn't have communion on Easter, though, or, you know, I think this is like something's missing. And then yesterday was the first Sunday of the month. I didn't have it then either, so. Why? I sort of asked that from the pulpit. Yeah, well, you don't, how often do you do communion? <laughs> hinted, hinted at it. It's not really, so I'm not a member. It's not really my place to say, hey, you know, we ought to be doing this. But uh, Anyway, back to this thing. There, there's the, the tension between the state or Constantinian societal Christianity that where Christianity forms... Uh, the glue of society. That's good, but when it makes claims that are almost necessary to its function, because its function is not to save people out of the world, but to glue the world together, it has a different function than biblical Christianity. But because it is related to God and the truth, it's still in some ways a good thing. But it also can deceive people. As it deceived, you know, uh, I think my mother's response to the conviction of my sin as a, as a young child was, well, you were baptized? God forgives you? Something like that. I can't remember the exact words, but it's like, no. <laughs> um Technically, if you're the child, say a minor child in a in a biblical sense, of a, a, with a believing parent, you're in a special relationship with God because of that. I guess commonly in Protestantism, in in like Baptists, they talk about uh, uh, prior to the. Uh, to the age of reason or something. That's, that's not really a good thing, but uh, a w way to put it. In Jewish tradition, Jesus, when it was taken up to the temple when he was 12 years old, that's when a, a Jewish boy becomes a man and is responsible to God himself for his relationship. But Paul talks about the, uh, the children of a believing, with a believing spouse uh, are holy to the Lord because of their believing parent. Obviously, there's a limit to that. So that would that'd be like a minor, minor in the sense of pre-adolescent, uh, really, would be the best way to put that. But that's... Uh, uh, so the, 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 this goes back to the infant baptism, too, because that was gradually coming in because people were afraid. They had this idea, the Augustinian kind of idea of original sin. Now, at that time, infants weren't being baptized, or at least at the time of Constantine, they weren't. Typically. I mean, a record of it. Constantine was not baptized until he was on his deathbed, 
which is why Constantine cannot be regarded as a Christian because he was unwilling to commit himself to Christ. He realized that would interfere with his position as emperor, as Caesar, and his duties. So he chose that. He chose not. So he was, like Donald Trump, a... a not uh, friendly toward Christianity. He was friend Donald Trump, you could say, was friendly toward Christianity, although Donald Trump, again, his evidence, the evidence of him choosing Paula White as his spiritual advisor definitely indicates that Donald Trump's Christianity is sub-Christian. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale, is, uh, his church is the one that he regarded as his church. Now, Norman Vincent Peale was definitely sub-Christian, definitely, <clears throat> even if he was Presbyterian, definitely sub, just like uh, um, Sh Robert Schuller, and of that same lineage, the seeker-sensitive movement, uh, uh, Rick Warren and others like that are sub-Christian. They don't have they don't have a concept of genuine Christianity. It indicates they are, they are unregenerate men, like Rick Warren. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, the, the treatment he gives of conversion in there is so shallow. It indicates he has no understanding of it, which means he's not born again. You're always going to have this tension between those who are born again and those who aren't, the natural and the spiritual. Uh, just like Cain and Abel, you have, you'll have the same thing. Abel was accepted by God and Cain wasn't. Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's wasn't. Because of that, Cain killed his brother Abel. So at state Christianity has always persecuted true Christians. Often killed them. Not that true Christians are trying to destroy state Christianity other than to bring it up to the standards of real Christianity. But I don't think Biblical Christianity has understood that in doing that, they are destroying the glue of society. So, see, like, oh, uh, Constantinian Christianity is like Old Testament Judaism, where the Old Testament uh, God, uh, the the law, is the glue. The only way you could make peace between the two would. State Christianity would have to stop making some of the claims about its its ability to save people through it, the institution of state Christianity and through the ministrations of the state priests. But they can't do that because that'll make them that'll take the glue the the, the glueiness away from them because they they have to bind together. Believers and unbelievers. But what happens is they end up binding together uh, the unbelievers and the real believers have to leave or be driven out or somehow hold their nose or have this strange, have to have a strange ability to hold contradictory ideas in their head without them being troubled by that. So real Christianity causes separation in society. See, that's the basic problem. She just said, do not think that I've come to bring peace, but a sword. I've come to set a, uh, a, a brother against his, you know, the members of, uh, of man's family will be his enemies. Why? Because Christ divides those who belong to him and those who don't. So there's this antipathy that will always be present between Constantinian Christianity in its various forms, including Protestantism, say, other than the United States. See, the Protestantism everywhere else was state Christianity. In America, is unchristianity. It's even worse. Everything goes here, sort of. 
as long as you worship the civil religion. We have the same problems here. America just doesn't have much glue at all. You know, you got to you got to worship the idols of Lincoln and Washington and Jefferson. That's why those temples exist in Washington D.C. That's why Mount Rushmore exists. The state civil religion, just like the Soviet Union and uh, communist China. You had the the Red Square and the mausoleum of Stalin, and you got Mao's tomb in in uh, Russia or in China. So you either have to have a living god like Stalin or Mao, or now Z. In North Korea, you have the the uh, the head there, the, the the deification of a person in order to form the glue. And that's why state Christianity bears witness to Christ, but there's this tension that I don't think can be overcome, um, even though I'd like to see it overcome. I just don't know how you, you could do that. Uh, you could... I don't think it will, it won't be overcome until Christ returns. It won't. Then you have his presence. And that eliminates this this problem because the, the 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 presence then will be the worship of Christ himself. Uh you'd have to if you you could have a possibly a a form of state religion that is tailored for society but acknowledges uh, the spiritual reality too, but I, I don't know. It wouldn't function for the state purpose that well if you did that. What how Catholicism and Orthodoxy generally deal deal with things like that was monasticism. You you provide an outlet for people that really want to be serious about God, <laughs> that removes them from the picture, essentially, or you put them in the priesthood. But the reason the people go into the priesthood in those kinds of religion are for the other reasons, usually. Lots of other reasons. Uh, which is why they are so corrupt, especially Roman Catholicism. So corrupt. Uh, and man-made traditions like so-called uh, uh, celibacy. Now, that doesn't exist in orthodoxy. But in Roman Catholicism, See, it's a man-made tradition. And if the Bible doesn't teach it, you don't have to believe it. That's my view. And I'm staying on solid ground. Because the Scripture tells us to contend for the faith delivered once for all unto the saints. That was delivered once for all in the first century by the apostles and by Jesus. Everything else is less than that or a corruption of that, adding things to that, that God didn't add to it. If it was necessary, it would be revealed in the New Testament. And if it's not, it's not necessary. And it's been added, which makes it a corruption, a downgrade. So there is this, again, I would rather... Okay, I guess I would rather be persecuted by a state Christianity than being living in a pagan society. Because <laughs> at least it bears witness of Christ. It's just it makes claims about itself and its authority that are untrue. Because it has to turn everybody in the country into Christians in order to pull them together. Because its purpose is not salvation. Its purpose is to provide the glue that holds society together. That's the fundamental contradiction right there. The purpose of Christianity. Is it glue for society or is it God's way for salvation 
of the individual. Different purposes end up with different religion, really, in a lot of in essential ways. And you get this conflict where the civil authorities will persecute true Christians because of that, because we undercut their system of glue. See, they have a system of glue that's based in truth in a lot of ways. In the re they worship the real God, but not... Worshiping God and belonging to God are two different things. You can be a believer in Jesus, in Christ, in God, and not have a living relationship with him. Because one's a system of religion and the other is a personal relationship. That's the difference, too. Roman Catholics are believers, most of them. But they're believers in a system of religion. They, are, they believe in Christ. But they are not born again, generally speaking. That's the difference. They are still natural. They are not supernatural. They are not. Uh, they they need these externals because Christ does not fill them. He's not in them. They're not in Him. They are in the church, not in Christ. In the institution of the church, the Constantinian institution. And that's always going to cause problems until Christ returns. Again, two separate purposes. Uh, and those purposes are at loggerheads because when you teach people that they're saved because they were sprinkled with water by a priest or a priest by another name as infants, and then they have to because they're sinners and they have to do works to atone for their sin and all this other stuff that's unbiblical. Uh, you, you, you might have some of the, the information about the gospel, some of the information about God, but you don't have the salvation of God. Constantinianism Constantinian Christianity does not save you. Because that's not its purpose. It may be, give you a place to be saved from. A fundamental knowledge about Christ and Christ dying for our sins and rising from the dead. But it doesn't call you to be saved. It just expects you already are because the church is what distributes the grace of God and salvation. The church, that church has interposed itself between people and God. And you can only have a relationship with God through the church, which is part of society and the state. Well, there's an hour spent discussing that repetitively, I suppose. But uh, perhaps that will... Doesn't answer, it doesn't solve the problem. I don't think, again, I don't think there is a solution to that problem because of the conflicting goals. But when we look at Catholicism and Orthodoxy, especially outside the United States... Um, even in the, inside the United States, as far as binding a community together, we see the differences. Of course, all this is derived. Orthodoxy, Catholicism, much of Protestantism, really all of Protestantism, uh, or true Protestantism, is 
uh, Constantinian Christianity. It's transplanted into the United States makes it an oddity. I mean, it doesn't. It's it's lost its function, which is why it's dying, perhaps here. Uh, but it still has its claims. The, the the institution of the church separated from the state still claims the power to save you, the authority to save you, the sacraments necessary for your salvation. And they are the way, the truth, and the life, rather than Jesus Christ himself. But you can only be saved. Salvation always, result, uh, uh, always results in a personal relationship with God through faith in Christ himself, apart from an institution, because that's what it is. That's what this book teaches. The other stuff is the tradition and wisdom of man.